This has all happened to you, right? You come up to the door, you pull, you pull again, and it still won't open. Do oh, it says push right there in English. What's wrong with you? Well, I'm here to tell you, it's not you, it's me. Well, actually, I don't mean me. That's the door speaking. I'm here as your translator today. I want to reveal to you the secret language of objects. So back to that door. It says push in English, but look at that handle. It's calling out to you. It's screaming, pull. It's irresistible. You hear that and you understand that language. There are lots and lots of bad doors in the world. Push or pull, twist or slide, left or right. And they've been around for thousands of years. And this has become my obsession. How do we interact with the world around us? And not just physically, but cognitively and even emotionally. And it's not just doors. All of these objects in our lives, how is it we come to know how to use them? How is it they come to have meaning in our lives? So I don't know what you do with your obsessions, but my obsession, I turned into a class. Because I wanted to learn more, and the best way to learn more is to teach a class. And so I've dragged a bunch of students at Northwestern University for the past few years along with me on this journey to explore this. I created a class called Designing Product Interactions, and I love introducing them to this notion and to these principles and to this language and helping them design new and interesting interactions. Our relationships with other people are really based on conversations. And interactions really are conversations. And the words of those conversations are subroutines. Now, I'm an engineer, and I apologize for introducing a nerdy computer science term here, but it's appropriate. Subroutines are these little bits of code that do a little thing, and when you put those all together, they create our experiences. I'll give you an example. When I come up to someone and meet them, I walk up, and we shake hands. We, we don't think about it. We don't think about what muscles do I use, where do I put my arm, how, do, how hard do I squeeze? We just do it because we understand the subroutine of shaking hands. And we not only understand the mechanics of that, but we also understand the deeper meaning, that connection with another person, the acknowledgement that comes along with that. Who here knows how to drive a car? Okay, good. Who here knows how to play a guitar? I see a few hands. I would argue that everyone here knows how to play guitar. Do you know that you hold it this way? And that you squeeze the strings over here and you strum them here? Then you know how to play guitar. Now, playing a guitar well is a whole other thing, and I can't do that either, and it sounds good when you can do that. But you know the playing a guitar subroutine. Turns out that many of these routines will pass the simple mime test. I can do something, and you know what I'm talking about. You know I'm holding a glass. We're toasting. You understand? Many of these subroutines are embedded in objects. There are only a few that actually we do just with people. Usually there's an object involved. And inside those objects are the code that we're reading and they're reading from us. The objects both enable and elicit our routines. If I put the steering wheel in front of you, you'd grab it, you'd know what to do. Here's another example. We'll go back to doors. Doors may have been around for millennia, but door knobs are actually a recent invention. They're less than 150 years old. The inventor of the doorknob combined the door handle with a latch, and with that, they created the doorknob subroutine. We all know it, don't we? That subroutine is a part of you. And it didn't exist when our country was founded. It's a new thing, and the creator of the doorknob created that subroutine. So, in fact, as a designer of products and services and such, I realized that we're not designing objects as much as we're designing the interactions. And these products, whether they're 10 or 100 or 1,000 years old, the person who created it, created the way in which we would interact with it. 
And all of our interactions with the world happen through our senses. That is our reality as we go through life. And we're continuously looking and taking in all of our senses. There's a part of the brain, the parietal lobe, where the signals from the different sensory systems come together. And they're all combined as we make sense of the world around us. And so out of that region, there's a live stream of information. And do you know what we call that live stream? Reality. Yes, we all have our own reality, and we make it ourselves all the time. Our interactions in the world are very rarely a single sense or a single modality. Life is multimodal. Take the cocktail party effect. You're in a big room with lots of people, music, lots of noise and people talking, and yet you're able to have a conversation with someone and isolate out just what they're saying and understand that. How does that happen? Psychologists have studied this, and what they've discovered is that we look at the other person's mouth and we watch that for information, and that fills in the gaps that are missing in the auditory channel. It turns out, at some level, all of us are lip readers. Here's another example. Let's take this pen. In fact, I think all, everyone was given a pen here. Pull out a pen you have and try this. Click. Now, did you hear that or did you feel that click? Ah, the answer is yes, all of the above. And in fact, if you study the sense of touch, when you felt it, you felt the pressure on your thumb, you felt the vibration of the little mechanism inside, and you felt the movement of your thumb through your proprioception. And all of those things came together for you to say, yes, that, that worked. Here's extra credit for you to try later. Study your pen and listen to it and see if you can tell the difference between the open click and the closed click. Now, I don't know if the designer of the pen intended this, but through our experiences over our lifetime with pens and doors and many other things, we know the sound of opening versus the sound of closing. And it's not just informational, it's also symbolic, those sounds. So when these sounds and other, when the senses come together and then they're congruous, meaning they're all consistent in meaning, and synchronous, meaning they're happening at the same time or at least at the right time, then everything comes together and we say, that just feels right. Or some people will say, it just clicks. And when they don't, you know it. It is very unsettling. Any of you who have ever watched a movie where the soundtrack doesn't match the video and so the lips are moving, but what you hear doesn't, and you just have to stop it. You know what I'm talking about. So our senses are taking all of these things in, and the people that make things have this whole palette of properties when they design products. What texture, what material, how heavy will it be, how will the mechanism move, and all of those things stimulate our senses. But that toolkit is rapidly expanding with the electronic revolution. This is just one page out of the Arduino catalog, which is um, electronic bits that you can buy and you can wire up different things. And these little sensors and effectors are devices that are getting smaller and cheaper and lower power and easier and easier to include in many devices. Let me give you an example your smartphone. Inside your smartphone are all of these sensors. That's how it knows what you're doing. So there are buttons that you press and it knows you press them. There's a touch screen that you can pinch and swipe. By the way, look, new subroutines are showing up all the time. It knows the temperature, acceleration, orientation, position in the world, even altitude. It has a microphone so it can listen to what you're saying. It also has a proximity sensor, so your phone knows when you're holding it close or not. It also has effectors. These are things, you could call them output devices. I like to call them effectors. They're things that affect you. So the display being one of the more obvious ones, also the speakers, there's vibrators inside, and even the buttons when they move and click. But be careful. If you have an older iPhone and you press that home button, you feel the click when it moves, right? If you have a newer iPhone, you feel the click 
but it doesn't actually move because there is no button. There's just a place for you to press your thumb. Inside, there's a little tiny device. It's called a linear resonant actuator that does a little vibration click, and you feel that thump, and you perceive that as movement. It's a fake. <laughs> but it's a good fake because it's synchronous and congruous. So these little sensors and effectors are going to start showing up in all sorts of interesting everyday objects, and they are going to get a lot more interesting. They're going to start being more aware and sensing subtle things about you, just like a good relationship with other people. They're going to give you subtle cues that you need at times without being intrusive. And just in general, they're going to become a lot more magical. Author and MIT researcher David Rose has a name for these objects, these everyday objects that are becoming special to us. He calls them enchanted objects. And these objects, we feel an emotional attachment to them because they are familiar and special and they understand us. These are things that we love. So is it possible to design for emotions, to design in love? If I were to ask many of you, what product in your life do you love? I'm guessing a number of you would choose your phone. And Part of that is because, it, yes, it does some amazing things. The capabilities of today's smartphone is really incredible. But more importantly, it's, it's interaction with you. It knows things that you're doing and gives you signals. And even more important than that is what you can do with the phone. And even more important than that is how you feel about yourself when you're using the phone. That's worth repeating. It's not what it does, but how it makes you feel about yourself. I do consulting with business leaders who want to lead their organization, be more innovative, and they want to make products and services that people love, that interact with them, that engage with them, and that they can establish a relationship to show that they care and connect with them. And so I hope you see that by listening to, thinking about the language of objects and being mindful of this, we can make a more connected organizations that we all work in. So I ask you to listen. Think about the secret language of objects. And I hope that you will never see the world around you the same way again. I hope when you come to that confusing door, you'll know it's not you. It's the designer. Because all of these objects, there are people behind them that did this, that made these things. And just like a poet can put together letters and words to make beautiful things that move us, we can use the secret language of objects to make better connections between people and the world, and make it a more thoughtful, feeling place. Thank you. <laughs>